His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his holy name together. You know, this is an encouragement in, in the scriptures this morning to come before the living God, uh, the holy God, to bless his name, uh, to magnify him and to exalt him this morning. And you know, it's a very good thing when we magnify the Lord. You know what it is to magnify someone or something? Uh, it's to make them look bigger. You know, if you get a magnifying glass, you look through that glass and it makes the thing look bigger. It doesn't make it any bigger. Because how many of you know this morning, you cannot make God any bigger. Yeah. But you can make your view of Him bigger. Yeah. Oh, let us magnify the Lord together. Yeah. Let's look upon Him who's seated upon the right hand of the Father. Yeah. Let's look upon Him this morning, the King of glory. Yeah. Let's look upon Him who alone is God. Who alone is worthy of all worship and honour and praise. Yeah. Oh, let us magnify the Lord together. Yeah. See, the enemy would have you magnifying your problems. Yeah. He'd have you magnifying your troubles. He'd have you magnifying the storm. Well, let us magnify the Lord together. Because God is greater. God is bigger than everything you will ever face. He alone is worthy. He alone is God. Oh, let us magnify the Lord together. Jesus, from everlasting to everlasting, ever the same, worthy of all honor and glory and praise. Come on, Castlegate Church, let us magnify the Lord. Spirit's wanting to, to, to minister in. He's wanting to, to break in. But the enemy, he wants to come against that. And if we're not careful, it can be just silly distractions. It could be that we're, we're not connected with God. We're not knowing what God's saying. And, you know, can we open out and in the toilet or, you know, wh whatever it is. But I'm just saying, church, let's, you know, let's be intentional about meeting with God. Let's be intentional about nothing is going to stop me from meeting with Jesus. He paid the highest price upon the cross of Calvary so that I can meet with him. We sung that song today, his presence is an open door. It's a wonderful open door that we can come in and meet with him. The devil hates it, you know. He hates it when we meet with Jesus. And he would love to distract us and stuff. I don't know about you, but I need to meet with Jesus. I need to meet with him every day of my life. And when we come together as believers, it's special. We come together as the family, as the body of Christ. You know, there's a special anointing when we gather together. That's why it says, when two or three meet together in my name, there I am in the middle. That's a corporate anointing. The God's coming amongst his people to do something special. You know, but the enemy wants to seek and distract us and have our minds on this and our eyes on this. And But actually, it's that we need that, that connection with him. We need to know the Holy Spirit moving and ministering uh, in people's hearts and lives. And on the back of that, it might be that he wants to use you as well. Praise God. Hallelujah. How many of you know that the, 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 the preacher or the pastor is just one part of the body? You might have a bit more of the mouthpiece than other pieces, but, won't, but, uh, but in Corinthians it says, when we come together, everybody has. I was sharing this last week. Everybody has something. Everybody has a testimony, has a song, you know, has, has something to bring a scripture. What's God been doing in your life? What God can say? Maybe he's giving you a word to speak out or to speak to somebody. You know, we're a Pentecostal church. <laughs> that means we want to be Pentecostal. That means we like the gifts of the Holy Spirit in operation, words of knowledge, words of wisdom, prophecy, you know, God speaking in and speaking to people. You know, that stuff is what changes people's lives. How many of you know that one moment in the spirit is better than a hundred years old labor? Yes. God knows the keys to unlock people's doors. He knows how to bring healing. He knows when someone needs a word of encouragement. He knows, the Bible says that, 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 that a right word fitly spoken is like uh, apples of silver and pictures of gold. Or, or the other way around. But, it's, but what he's saying is it's something beautiful. It's actually something beautiful. And sometimes we meet people and I don't know about you, maybe people hear people's problems and stuff and some people going through a tough time. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. I don't know what they need. He does. He does. 
One touch from the king changes everything. And I don't know, I'm sorry church, but I'm passionate about this. We need Jesus. We need the Holy Ghost. I ain't got better things to do than just meet up and have a religious session. I like a good sing song, don't get me wrong. But it's him. It's his presence. It's the power of the church moving with the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, you know, we're a young church, so I just want to keep feeding this in. You know, we've all got to play our part. We're all part of the body. But what, what do we want to look like? Do we want to be an on fire, Holy Ghost movement that's uh, seeing lives impacted for the gospel? Hallelujah. Well, we all need to, oh, come on. <laughs> but we, we all need to play our part in that, don't we? You know, getting hungry for God. But just going back to that, uh, you know, just, just be aware of the enemy's devices. You know, Paul says we're not ignorant of his devices. Distraction is a big one, discouragement's another. But distraction, you know, he would just love to distract and take your eyes off Jesus. He does it in everyday life. You know, when Peter was walking on the water, as he was looking at Jesus, it was good. He was walking on water. I mean, come on, man, when you're looking at Jesus and you're walking with Jesus, you're walking on water. But the storms came and arose. And he took his eyes off Jesus because he began to look at the storm. He got distracted. And the minute he took his eyes off Jesus, he began to sink. He began to sink. So if the devil can't stop you coming to Jesus, he wants to stop you going on in Jesus and he'll do everything. He'll send storms. He'll use storms. He'll... The key church, keep your eyes on him. Hallelujah. We're not of this world, are we? We may be in it, but we're not of it. You know, we can't live kingdom uh, with the principles of this world. You know, we need to allow the Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us and to... And let's be intentional. How many of you know this is warfare? This is warfare, man. We're a church plant. We're seeking to plant churches. We're wanting to see the kingdom of God advanced. You know what I mean? This is warfare. And you're called here to be uh, for such a time as this. Why? Because you're soldiers, because you're warriors in, in Jesus Christ. I believe it. I believe it. <laughs> Praise God. So hopefully that's fair. Uh, it's been some encouragement. Jesus, tell enough if you want to. Really. <laughs> yeah, so, oh, so this morning then, we're on part two of our, <coughs> excuse me, our sermon on, on Relentless. It was supposed to be a one part of it, of sharing some stuff last week before the sermon, a bit like today, and we had to, to split it into two. <laughs> so, uh, but just to, to recap then, we looked really on the, the theme of Relentless, and uh, the reading was from Acts chapter 20. If you want to turn with me, feel free. Acts chapter 20, and it was verses 21 to 24. And of course, it was speaking about the Apostle Paul, and it says this Testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. And see now, I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that the chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me. Nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy Amen. and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel Amen. of the grace of God. Amen. And really last week, as we looked at this, I kind of pitched it as looking at some of the qualities in the early church, of how the early church looked, as a way of kind of wanting to model ourselves on what the early church looked like. You know, we said there's a lot of good in the church today, a lot of stuff that we can learn from today. But the idea is actually, more than being moulded on other churches, we want to be moulded on what, what the Bible says. You know, we don't necessarily want to look like Christians of the world, but we want to look like Christians of the Word. And I just feel that there were some qualities in the early church, lived in a totally different time, different context, but some qualities in the early church that maybe we don't possess today. Uh, but I'm still old-fashioned, I still believe that the Word is the Word. I still believe that this is the model. I really still believe this is what we're, we're supposed to look like. And I believe that when we come in alignment with Him, when we come in alignment with His Word, 
then I believe that we see it take place. Yeah. See, alignment, if you break that word of alignment, it's a line that was meant. This is alignment, a line that was meant. We're supposed to walk according to the word and according to what uh, God says. And I believe if we looked a bit more like this uh, in our mode, then the results would look a bit more like this as well. Hallelujah. I'm sorry, but I'm just old fashioned to believe that. I'm still old fashioned to have enough faith to believe that the word works. Hallelujah. I don't care what the world says. I don't care what it looks like out there. I care what it looks like in here. And if God says it, I believe it. And that settles it in Jesus' mighty name. So we want to be a church that's molded on the word of God. Of course, there's a lot of, a lot of work that takes place for that. A lot of work in my life, a lot of work in your life, a lot of work uh, when we come together as a body. But you know, Jeremiah talked about God uh, being the potter and we the clay. Yeah. And the idea is that we come around the Word, when we come around the Word and the Spirit and we, and we see what God's saying to us, that God would shape us as a church, that He would shape us as a people, that He'd cause us to look like uh, this, you know what I'm saying? And that we would have results like this. We said at the early church that uh, there were a church that were in revival. They were in revival. It was birthed in the fire. On the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came, the Holy Spirit was poured out and there was tongues of fire that landed upon each of them. Such was the fire in their hearts and in their lives that it didn't stay in the upper room, it didn't stay in the four walls, but it flowed out outside of that church gathering and it went out into the world. Uh, Jerusalem was turned upside down. The world was turned upside down. Why? Because there was in revival. Why? Because the Holy Spirit, the living God, was on them. Mm. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't read anywhere the Holy Spirit's gone anywhere. <laughs> Holy Spirit's not gone anywhere. <laughs> Same Holy Spirit's with us today. Yes. I believe that's what the Holy Spirit wants out of our lives today. Yes. You know, if we would just walk with Him, if we would just believe the Word, if we'd just be open to what He says, when He says, go and speak over here, we speak <laughs> over there. When He says, go over here, we go over there. I believe that when we get in alignment with the Holy Spirit, God's Word and His will and His ways, we begin to see God's results <laughs> yeah. take place in yeah. Yeah. and through our lives. So these guys that were in revival, <coughs> uh, they were radical. Uh, the church was radical. It was known as turning the, the, the world upside down in such a short time. Although we know that the church really turned the world the right way up because uh, the world was already upside down. Uh, but, but turned it the right way up to be God's way. And one other quality that I see uh, in the early church that I believe that sometimes and we were lacking a little bit today is that relentlessness. You know, when you look at the early church, when you look at the disciples, the apostles, particularly the apostle Paul who we're looking at, this man was relentless. They was relentless. And to be relentless is someone who keeps going and never gives up. In fact, relentless is the opposite of to relent. To relent. And to relent is to ease off, slacken up, let up, ease, relax, drop off, die down, lessen, decrease, diminish. <laughs> These are some of the, the words to relent. But how many know this ain't days for the church to be relenting? You know, when we look at uh, the world and the need for the gospel, it's not a time to be relenting. As we see darkness abounding everywhere where in the world, and the world needs the light, it's not time for us to be relenting. Mm -hmm. When you see the lies of the enemy being pushed on such a scale in governments and schools and around the world, and uh, the evil that's coming in, how many need to know it's not a time for the church to relent yeah. on the truth? Yeah. But we need to be relentless. Do we believe this stuff? Yeah. Is this the word of the living God? Is God looking for people that would be relentless and stand for truth, will preach the gospel, no matter what it looks like? I don't know about you, I ain't in no club. I'm in the church of the living God. We got power. Hallelujah. There's something that God needs right now. It's the church of the word of being relentless. Like it was in the beginning. Don't be relentless no matter what in preaching the gospel and spreading the word. And we saw last week that. Uh, the Apostle Paul, he was relentless in, in persecuting the church at first, but after he had that encounter with God, and God changed his life and put a call upon his life to yes. preach the gospel, uh, to be a light uh, and bear God's name before the Gentiles, the kings and the people of Israel. Uh, from that point on, he became relentless in serving God. And last week we looked at verse 21 and said that he was relentless in opportunities to preach the gospel. Verse 21 says that he testified to Jews and Greeks uh, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. And we see that time and time again. And one of the examples we looked at was uh, from Acts 17, when he rocked up into Athens. And it says in Athens that the whole city is given to idols. There was idol worship there and there all these philosophers. But it says there in verses 16 to 17, 
uh, that he preached in the synagogue to Jews. He preached to Gentile worshippers. He preached in the marketplace daily. He preached to the philosophers. He preached to them Jesus. Uh, he then went and preached uh, before the multitudes at the, on Mars Hill. Yeah. He preached to them the unknown God. This man was relentless in taking opportunities to fulfill the call of God upon his life. God had called him to preach the gospel and he was relentless. He didn't care what they thought in the synagogue. He didn't care what they thought in the marketplace. He didn't care what the philosophers thought. He knew that God had put a call upon his life to preach the gospel and that's what he was going to do. I don't care. I'm going to be relentless. I'm going to take every single opportunity. You need to know about Jesus. That's what he's called me to do. That's what I'm going to do. Hallelujah. That we would be relentless like the Apostle Paul. Not to back down, not to, you know, be, be wishy-washy about it, but to take every opportunity that we can. You know, do we hold the truth? Yes. Is the gospel good news? Yes. Is it the power of God unto salvation? Yes. And God's entrusted us with it and yes. called us to be co-laborers together with him in it. Mm. You know, I was sharing last Sunday night, it says that without me you can do nothing. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. We know that we can. But actually, without him, we can do nothing. But actually, without us, he will do nothing. He wants to use you. He wants to use me to preach the truth, to preach the gospel. That's the mission of the church, isn't it? Well, let's be re relentless about it. I'm just not hoping this, the potter's hand is shaking your life a little bit. See, so I've lived in times, and I, and I get it. I get it. Where people say, you know, let us look a bit better. Uh, let us work a bit better. Maybe we'll get some opportunities. I, I, I get that. And maybe that's a small part of it. Uh, but I believe it's preaching the gospel. Yeah. See, I, I, I've grown up where, you know, with the thinking of uh, Francis of Assisi, whatever his name was. But he said something like, um, let's go out and preach the gospel and we'll use words if necessary. <laughs> <laughs> well, God bless Francis and Sissy, but what a load of rubbish. <laughs> I get what he's saying. If you ain't speaking the gospel out, you ain't preaching the gospel. Forget Francis. What did Jesus say? He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Forget Francis. <laughs> <laughs> no, God bless, God bless, God bless. <laughs> you know what I'm saying though, don't you? And I do get it. We have got to live it. We have got to let the light shine. But actually, you know, we've got to preach the gospel yeah. uh, in Jesus' name and, and, and take them opportunities. So he was relentless in the opportunities and then he was also relentless in obedience. In verse 22 he says, And see now, I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there. Now it's interesting that, isn't it? So he's bound in physical chains, um, but it says that he was bound in the spirit. You know, this was God's will for his life. This was his plan. It wasn't really man that had hold of him, uh, but he submitted himself to the, to the will of God. He was bound in the spirit of God. And it had been said that actually every town that he'd been to on the way, he didn't know what was going to happen ahead of him, but that in, the, in the, every town he went to, the spirit said to him, you know, that um, the Holy Test Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. Mm. Wow, what a word. Anyone open to a word like that from mm. God? <laughs> you know, if we got a word like that, we'd think that was the devil, wouldn't we? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but then, that ain't right. And this is some of the stuff I, I was sharing last week. I, you know, I've got a, a, a beam of body about the person centered gospel. You know, where it's all about you and God blessing your life and you know you're getting a better job and a better business and a better salary and all that type of stuff. Oh. And we know that God does love us and He does want to bless us and He does want what's best for our life, but that's not necessarily His will. No. If it is, the Apostle Paul missed it. <laughs> the early church missed it. That's right. But they lived for God and their obedience to God no matter what it looked like. Mm. He said, you know, all, I, all that I know is that chains await me and tribulations, mm. but I'm bound in the Spirit. Why? Because that's what God's called me to do. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Thank you, Lord. See, since in Acts chapter 9, verse 16, even at the beginning when he was called, it was said how much that he would suffer for the gospel. But yet he was still obedient. Amen. Why? Because he met the living Christ. He found grace and he found mercy. He found the one that suffered and died and gave his whole life for him. Hallelujah. Therefore, he was willing to live his whole life for Jesus. What's Jesus done for you? Amen. He set you free. Hallelujah. 
He's cleansed you of your sins. He's given you life. Not only life now, but life in eternity. And if we're carriers of that good news, we need to be able to share that with people as well. But it's being obedient. No matter what. No matter what it looks like. I mean, if you was going for a job, and uh, you got two offers back for a job, and one was a certain amount of salary, and the other one was double the amount of salary, which one would you go for? You'd think, oh, that's God, that is the double amount of salary. It's not it. He wants to bless my life. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. That might not be God's will for your life. Yes, he does want to bless. I'm not saying he's not. You know what I'm saying? But I'm trying to make the point that, you know, there needs to be a discernment. You need to know what God's called you to, you know, and be obedient, wanting to live his life. See, the whole gospel starts, Jesus said, if anyone wants to follow me, let them deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. Right. What is it to deny yourself and take up the cross? It's, it's to die. It's, it's an end to my life. The apostle Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Not I, but Christ lives in me. You know, have you really given your life to Christ? Have you laid it on the altar? Have you put it on the cross? Have you said, I'm dead to myself, oh God, but your life through me, your world in me. See, Jesus said anyone that uh, finds their life will lose it. But those that would lose their life for my sake will find it. Christianity is really a call to die, you know that? Yeah. Yeah. So you can't have life before you die. The problem is sometimes we want both. You can't have both. It's either Christ or the world. Which one do you want? See, in Acts chapter 26, verse 19, when Paul was before King Agrippa, took the opportunity to preach to King Agrippa and all of the court and wished that they were uh, as free as he was. There he is, he bonds it, but, he, but really it's because he's free inside because he's found Christ. And he wants them to know that freedom. But when he's talking to Agrippa, he said, he was not disobedient to the holy vision. He wasn't disobedient to what God had called him to do. What about you? What about you? Challenge. I know. You know, some people, they struggle with the will of God over their lives. What, what's God calling me to do? What, what is it? You know, if I know God, I would do it. But let me tell you, get, get involved with the church where you're planted, first of all. Start in the small things. Fill in the gaps. You know, we've got gaps all over this place. You know, they always say it's better to, 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 to steer a moving car. See, if your heart is for God and you want to serve and you want to get in and you know you're part of the local church and you're just getting involved and, and the car's moving, and God's Spirit then can begin to move you and direct you in. Plus, you know, promotion is found in the small things, when you're faithful in the small things. Because God knows when you're faithful in the small things, you can be faithful in much. How many people rock up and want to preach on day one? But don't want to do the toilets? Stuff like that. I'm being serious, friends. I'm being serious. It's in that place where nobody sees, where nobody knows, but God does. And you find promotion. But you know, there's a... A vision over this church, you know, to make the gospel known uh, to all people. Hallelujah, you're, you're part of that. However, that when you get involved and when you walk with God, mm -hmm. he'll move that car and get you wherever you want to be. But you'd be obedient to him in the big things, in the small things. Mm -hmm. um, like you could say, as the Apostle Paul said, that I wasn't disobedient to the holy calling. You know, I won't want to get before God and realise that I've Gone the wrong way, gone the wrong route. I've gone my own way to try and get there. The thing is, we've got not careful if we want to go our own, our own way, we won't get there. But it's his way, isn't it? Yeah. But then we'd be relentless in obedience. You know, no matter what it looks like. You know, it, it didn't look rosy for Paul, did it? You know, going the way that God wanted him to go, it did not look rosy for him. But he knew that God had spoken to him, and therefore, you know, he was relentless in obedience. Yeah. In verse 24, he was relentless in opposition. Do say this is an encouragement today, folks. You know? <laughs> <laughs> a, a challenge, but it's good to be challenged as well, isn't it? Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm challenged. Verse 24, he was relentless in opposition. He said, none of these things move me. Everything that, that the Apostle Paul, he was called and he would face suffering. He knew that tribulations and chains awaited. But then he said, none of these things moved him. Why? Because he knew that it was God's plan. And actually, when we see the things that the Apostle Paul 
suffered. It's, uh, it's incredible. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 to 28, he said, From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've been in the deep, in journeys, often in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own country, men, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness, often in hunger and thirst, in fastings, often in cold and nakedness. Beside the other things, what comes upon me daily, our deep concern for all the church. Who is weak and am not weak? Am I not weak? Who is made to stumble and I do not, and do I not burn with indignation? So you see, see the Apostle Paul there, that, that, that relentlessness. I don't know about you, how, how far down have you got down the list? For he was like, this ain't the plan of God. I ain't having this. Oh, I'm not out, I'm giving up. But he didn't give up. Why? Because he had the quality of relentlessness. You know, because he knew God had called him. That even the opposition that he, that he faced, all the perils that he faced, all the trials, all the tribulations, the persecutions, he was still relentless to fulfill the, the call of God upon his life. See, that was relentless then. I wonder what relentless now looks like. Thank God we don't have to face that stuff. There are Christians around the world today that have to face that stuff. We don't. We're actually quite blessed the context that we live in. You know, we're not, not called as of yet to any of that. Thank God. But what does our relentlessness look like compared to their relentlessness? You know, some people don't come to church because they can't be bothered. Well, they're lying today. Oh, I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm joking, man. But, you know, the amount of people that I've seen that have, that have clocked out of church because someone looked at the wrong way. Someone sat in their seat. Some, that's some, some childishness. I say people like that, when we get to heaven, you're going to see the apostle boy, you're going to be embarrassed. You know what I'm saying? You're clocked out because of that stuff. What I'm saying is, you know, there needs to be some, some stuff, some relentlessness in us, some, some toughness, you know, some resilience. You know, we are the church. Yes, we are uh, in a spiritual warfare. But whatever comes, you know, we're going to be relentless to God. We're going to be relentless in the opposition. You know, I love uh, the Apostle Paul in, in Acts 14. This, this one just, just does it for me. He's uh, preaching the gospel in Derby Lystra. They stone him. They think to death because they drag his body outside, dump him outside. He comes round. Next day, gets up, back in the town again, <laughs> preaching the gospel. <laughs> I mean, this man was incredible, Amen. relentless. You know, not because he was super Paul, but because he had a super God. Yeah. And he had committed his life to him, and he was resilient. So we need to be resilient and relentless in doing God's will, in winning souls, in advancing the kingdom. You know, no matter what opposition comes. And I believe, really do believe now, that there will be more and more opposition. How many you know it's, it's difficult to speak the truth now in certain circles? Yeah, yeah. Because straight away you're blasted down. Yeah. Because everything's tolerated except God and His Word. Yeah. Everything else is tolerated. You dare uh, say what God says. You dare say what the Word says. That's now. It's not going to get any better, folks. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. You know? And we need to be people that are relentless in standing for the truth and standing against those things. So in Acts chapter 20, verse 24, Paul says, None of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish the race with joy and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Do you have that much relentlessness to finish the call that God has put on, on your life? Hallelujah. 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 So we might read this and we might think, oh, this is the Apostle Paul we're talking about here. You know, this, this man, this, this great anointing, you know, chose by God. I don't know how you, you picture the Apostle Paul. Do you, you picture him as a man with a, 
uh, a red cape and a blue suit and a <laughs> SB on his chest and looks like he's been doing some, some heavy sets in the gym. But actually history would say that he, shook, that he was short, he was bow-legged, he had a bald head, he had a big nose, that he was short-sighted. And of course these things, they're not in the Bible, but it does say that he was single. <laughs> <laughs> And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 10, it says that he was unimpressive to look at. You know, these guys, they're mocking him. He says, oh, they say, oh, you might have been powerful in word, but actually you were weak in appearance. There was nothing. The NIV uses the word uh, unimpressive. See, this, this, this man, he, he, he was unimpressive to look at. You know, I've heard it said if he was preaching in your church and you, you turned up to pick him up from the, the station, you know, you only know him by his letters, you only know him by his reputation, uh, that you're expecting this great mighty man of God to turn up. The Apostle Paul gets off, off the coach, you, or the train, you'd miss him. You'd not really <laughs> there. You'd just overlook him because there was nothing to look at. Yeah. He was nothing, he was unimpressive to look at. <laughs> It was also unimpressive in wisdom. And that was by choice. You know, he chose to be unimpressive by wisdom. I mean, really, um, by the world standard, he was a clever man. He was a real thinker of his time, real theologian, you know, had studied and stuff like that. Um, but you know, when he got to the Corinthians, he says, I'm, deter I'm determined to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. Now, when he went to the Corinthians, he actually went there after Athens. You know, we spoke about him speaking to the philosophers on Mars Hill. And it's actually interesting that then when he gets to the Corinthians, he says, I'm determined to know nothing against you, uh, nothing amongst you except Christ and crucified. It's like when he was in Athens, you know, I think he tried to communicate to them with his philosophy mind. He tried to bring to them uh, some of their own arguments, although he preached the gospel. But then we never hear anything about Athens again. But then he rocks up at Corinthians, he says, I'm determined to know nothing against you except Christ and crucified. I don't know about you, have you ever argued with anyone scripture to scripture to scripture to scripture? You try to explain this and you try to teach them that and you try to, and you get nowhere. But the simple gospel, Christ and Him crucified. Hallelujah. What am I saying today? You're not going to look impressive. You're not going to know it all. You're not going to have this wonderful wisdom. The Apostle Paul didn't. You know, he just had God with him and he's relentless to fulfill God's call upon his life. Is that you? You know, if you just say, Here I am, Lord, use me. Wherever, whenever. In farm foods, on the bus, <laughs> wherever. I'm being serious, you know, God will yes. use us. But let's be relentless in taking the opportunities. Being relentless uh, in obedience to Him and even relentless against opposition. Oh, I don't want to say anything, you know, they might uh, call me names or something. Uh. I'm being, being serious in the church. I, I get some of that. I've been under some of that thinking we want to, we want to be acceptable and there's something in that, in, in, in building a relationship. But actually, we're not called to, to, to water it down so that we blend in. We're supposed to be different. What fellowship has light with darkness? You know, the two are contrary to the, to, to the other. Right. You know, Jesus Christ stands alone amongst everybody else and we serve him. Yeah, we're going to stand out. Yes, we're going to get persecuted. He promised us we will. Yeah. He said, if they persecuted me, I don't think you're going to get away with it. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe if we blend in enough, we will. But if we blend in too much, then our light becomes murky and it becomes darkness. We're not called to fit in. We're called to stand out. Yeah. I mean, it's a bit radical this morning. <laughs> that's, that's what I see, see in my Bible. I'm just trying to encourage us. You know, because I, I believe, you know, in six, they said it was in six months, Jerusalem was the city of 600,000 people. In six months, 200,000 people were saved. In six months. It's six months. We've been here three and a half years, church. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I still believe it, friends. I still believe it. Yeah. In Jesus' name. Yeah. One Corinthians 4, he was uh, unimpressive to the world. The Apostle Paul talked about him being uh, ex exhibited. His life as a spectacle to the world. The people in the world would look at him and not think much of him because of the things that he went through. Uh, but nevertheless, he went on and did those things as can, can we. So the Apostle Paul, he planted church after church in city after city. He fulfilled the call of God on his life because he had this uh, one quality. Well, he had many qualities, but this, this is what we're looking at, that he was, he was relentless, uh, that he, would, he was just willing uh, to go through it. 
So someone said that if we create the results, so we to create create <laughs> create the results of something so intensely that the work is irrelevant. You could certainly say that of the Apostle Paul. You know, he craved uh, to fulfill the call of God upon his life. He craved to, to fill the God to, to preach the gospel and to take every opportunity. He craved it. Therefore, the work was irrelevant. What he came against was irrelevant. See, how, how intensely do you desire to see God be saved? How, how, how much do you desire to see God move in power? How much do we desire to see the things in Acts played out in our, in our life? Sometimes I say, I'm going to go for that time. And I've got to clock into a prayer meeting. I've got to. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Thanks, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> I think this just challenges some thinking today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, everything is easier when you stop expecting it to be easy. You know that? That goes with everything. Life, ministry, whatever. You know, it's easier when we stop expecting it to be easy. See, a lot of people come to God because they think he's going to make it easy. Mm -hmm. yeah, it doesn't happen that way. Yeah. Yes, he blesses our life. Yes, he helps us. Yes, he leads us and guides us. But he ain't going to make it easy. That's that person-centered gospel again. If you come by way of that gospel, you're going to get disappointed. You know, he, he never said it's going to be easy. Stop thinking it's going to be easy. It's tough. Hallelujah, it's tough. Life's tough. Work's tough. Uh, but we have a saviour yeah, that leads us on yes. through it. So I'll just finish with this uh, quote this morning. Because time is going on. It says, motivation will get you moving, but determination will keep you going. Motivation will get you moving. Determination will keep you going. Mm -hmm. My hope is to, you know, motivate you on a Sunday morning to good works, provide you to good works, and to motivate you to live for Christ, you know, to preach the gospel, to motivate you. How, how many is that, that motivation gone after, after Sunday dinner? <laughs> Or maybe someone you hang on in there, I can keep it going till Tuesday, but then Tuesday back down. Which back through to Sunday, give me some motivation back up to Tuesday. But, but the motivation is only supposed to get you going. It's determination that will keep you going. Determination. Uh, that today you say, I'll be determined. That's what relentlessness is. I'm determined to live for Christ no matter what it looks like. If it's not easy and it's tough, I'm determined to live for Him. I'm yeah. determined to preach the gospel to, to the poor, even if people come against me in persecution. I'm determined. Hallelujah. So, yeah. It's almost like determination to fuel. Determination keeps it going. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. But it's making that decision today. So you're making that decision today. And no matter what it looks like tomorrow, I'm still going to be in that place of, of walking with Christ yeah. and seeing this plan fulfilled over my life. Hallelujah. Amen. I was just going to ask, Scott, would you mind uh, coming forward, please? We'll, we'll pray in just a second, but I'll, I'll just read these, these Bible verses. Romans 12, 11, it says, Not slothful in business, but fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of Christ mm -hmm. in you. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of Christ, knowing that your labour is not in vain. <laughs>